Cheers, David. Thank you very much. All right, Zach, thank you so much for that great introduction. I'm excited to see everybody uh, who's able to make it out tonight. We are going to be recording this as well. I've got probably about as many people that um, are logged in right now that also want to see a recording of this. So um, I hope that's all right. A little bit of run of show. What we're going to do, I'm going to give my presentation um, basically looking at effective advocacy during the General Assembly. If you have any questions during that, if you can just drop them in the chat box, I'll be watching the chat box and um, some of them I might answer right away, others I'll wait till the end. And if all goes well, we'll also have some Q&A time at the end as well. And aim to wrap up by 7.45. That is the goal. So you guys can enjoy the rest of your um, Thursday evening. And David, not to throw you off, but uh, there's a 40 minute limit on this. So seven, I think 7.35 is probably what we're looking for. That works. I can be, always can be concise. All right, so let me go ahead and get my screen share going on. This, I thank you for your patience. And we'll try it this way. Yes. Yeah. All right, Zach, how are we looking right now? Yep, I can see it. Great. All right, wonderful. So as Zach was mentioning, um, my name is David Smith. I recently started in Thrive Advocates Fuel Solutions. That's building on my experience being an advocate in the General Assembly of Virginia as well as working for elected officials in the General Assembly as well. Um, the whole goal of in Thrive is to really help equip people to have their voices heard in Richmond so that smart policy can get enacted. Too often it's just the big companies with the big dollars that are able to influence lobbyists or influence legislators. My goal is that we can all do that. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about effective advocacy during the General Assembly session. So as you guys know, the General Assembly is about to start. I'm starting up next week. So this is basically going to be a little bit of a, a quick course, nothing too deep, nothing too in-depth, but hopefully just to help you get ready for what's right around the corner. So what are, what are our goals tonight? First, how do we monitor legislation? This is one of those important things. We can't effectively advocate if we don't know what the bills are that are making their way through the General Assembly. How do we make contact with legislators? This is one of those areas I think probably has the biggest level of fear and trepidation among people that I talk to, especially if you've never done it. Um, so we're gonna spend some time talking about how we actually contact legislators, the different options we have, and how do we communicate persuasively? Uh, once again, we've only got about 40 minutes. Um, so we're not gonna go too much of a deep dive into this, but I wanna give you guys basically a framework of how you can build your communications with legislators so that you're able to get your point across effectively and efficiently. All right, so monitoring legislation. Once again, as I said a moment ago, if you don't know what bills are out there, you don't know what you need to advocate for, and just as importantly, advocate against. So there are three sites that are really key for monitoring legislation. The first one is the Virginia Public Access Project. Then we've got Richmond Sunlight, and then we have LIS, Legislative Information System. That those three right there, if you're using those three sites, you will probably have a good handle on what's happening in the legislature during the session. So let's look at these now. Um, the Virginia Public Access Project, VPAP, um, as folks call it. This organization started, oh geez, I think it was over 20 years ago now, back when there were really no public access requirements for legislation, for legislators, and they did the hard work of really digging in and compiling that information. Now they have an incredibly robust system that allows you to do deep dives into legislators, um, where their funding comes from, who's backing them, what bills they're supporting, what um, 
topics are important to them. Uh, they also have bill tracking there as well. So you can follow along bills as they're moving through the session. Uh, it's a very user-friendly interface. Uh, it basically takes most of its bill information from LIS, but in a much more user-friendly way. The biggest help that VPAP can be and has been for me is their daily newsletter. Um, during the week, Monday through Friday, they send out a newsletter in the morning, I think right at 7 a.m. usually, and that's going to have all of the information that you need to know around the state with what's happening in the realm of policy and politics. So even if you're in Richmond or Norfolk or Northern Virginia, you're going to see what's happening in Blacksburg or Withville or Front Royal and vice versa. So it's a great website. I encourage you to sign up for their newsletter uh, just so you have an idea of what's happening in the state. Next is Richmond Sunlight. This is another one of those good bill tracking websites. It's fairly user friendly. What sets it apart is there is a section for public comments on any bill. Now, these are not comments that actually go to the legislators that will be debating the bills, but it gives you as an interested citizen as an advocate, an idea of what people are thinking about and talking about when it comes to legislation you might be interested in or trying to stop. So I find that is a really helpful piece right there, just giving you a little bit of ability to track where public opinion is, and then that can then help form some of your messaging on these bills. And finally is LIS, <clears throat> Legislative Information Service, or yeah, Legislative Information Services. This is the official General Assembly website. It offers um, lobbyists in a box, which is a great tool where you sign up and you can put in keywords, um, you can put in legislators, and it will track any of the um, any of those for you. And you'll get email notifications on updates for any bills you're tracking, any legislators you're tracking, any keyword topics that you're tracking. So all of these other sites for their bill tracking, they feed off of LIS. LIS is going to be the authoritative source. The information is going to be there first. Now, it is updated by people. It doesn't happen automatically when a bill vote happens. So there can sometimes be a lag. So if you're in session, if session's going on and you're not in Richmond and you really want to see how a vote goes, make sure you are logged on and viewing that streaming session of either the committee, subcommittee, or floor session. So these are your resources. Using these, you can pretty much track everything that's happening during the General Assembly session. You can track all those bills and have a good idea of what's going on in Richmond. So that's our first step. So we've got that. So next thing is how do I contact legislators? And I didn't say my legislator, I just said legislators in general, because as an advocate, you don't want to just be talking to your senator or your delegate you want to be talking to all the key senators and delegates that you need to on your bill. So when I say key, what do I mean? I mean those folks that are in the subcommittee in the House, as well as the committee in the House that is going to be hearing the legislation that you care about, as well as the committee in the Senate. Now, fun fact, the Senate committees and House committees names do not always match up. So you need to be paying attention to where those bills are going. Those last websites, which I'll share in the chat at the end, those last websites will tell you which committee or subcommittee your bill is going before. And then you can also use those websites to find out who those legislators are that are on those committees. So by using that information, who those legislators are that are on the committees that your bill is going before, or the one that you're trying to stop is going before, you can then focus your time with those folks. So how do I contact them? You got a lot of different ways. We're going to have a little bit of fun right now. So the phone. People still use the phone. I would tell you that working in the office of a delegate, we do get phone calls and phone calls are important. That's showing us that you're taking the time to actually call and you're not just sending out a mass email to every single delegate and every single senator. You're actually taking the time to call me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the Virginia Coalition on Solitary Confinement is going to be doing a, our own phone banking event tomorrow where we're calling up delegates and senators at their home office to let them know what we care about. So this is 
even though it's a phone, maybe not a rotary phone like that one, but even though it's a phone, it is still very important. Visiting in person. Yes, just going in and sitting down with a legislator or their staff is key. Now, during the session, you're not gonna have that long. You're gonna have maybe 15 minutes max to make your case. So you're gonna to wanna to go in there and be ready with a one pager, basically a sheet of paper that has why you support or oppose a bill and why that delegate should support or oppose it. You're looking at a few little facts, you're looking at maybe some figures or maybe a couple of personal stories, all very short, all on one page, all quickly digestible. But going in person is key. You can either just walk around the building and um, go from office to office, or you can make appointments ahead of time. Just want to give you a heads up. If you do make appointments ahead of time, it does not guarantee that you'll be seen by the delegate, the senator, or their um, senior aide. Uh, meetings happen, sessions run long. So even if you do have an appointment, you're sometimes just going to have to accept that it got canceled or you're not going to be seeing who you thought you're going to be seeing. But any of that FaceTime, that does help. Knowing that there are people coming into the office that lifts your message strength up higher than somebody who's just sending an email. But you know what? I don't want to minimize emails either. Emails are key, especially if you've got a mailing list of folks or a group of friends that you can get really organized behind an idea. Last year, there was a really bad bill about bicycles and I cycle a lot. I got a petition started and we emailed that to the key senators that were here in the bill and the bill died. Between our work and a few other groups doing that work, it ended up killing a really bad bill that the cycling community was against. So when you're sending these emails, if you're sending it to your delegate or your senator, you always want to make sure that you are including the fact that you are one of their constituents. A constituent email is worth probably 10 to 50 times as much as a non-constituent email. Now, that being said, still email those ones that aren't that you're not the constituent of, that you don't live in their district, but just know that you're gonna have an outsized voice when it comes to those issues that you're reaching out to your very own delegate or your very own senator about. Next is looking at going to the actual committee hearings. And you can do this in person or you can do it virtually. Um, virtual is a new option that just happened during COVID and they are continuing that on into this session again. So you can go online usually 12 to 24 hours before the actual scheduled hearing and sign up to speak at that hearing. And this you can do from your home, whether you're in Abington or Arlington, if you can't make it to Richmond, you can still sign up virtually. So how do you do this? If you're watching LIS and you're seeing that that bill is going to be heard, there's going to be a link that will take you to that committee. And there should be a link on that page that will say sign up for hearings at whichever time your bill is being heard, whichever subcommittee your bill is being heard. Um, if you have questions about that, once session happens, just shoot me an email. I'd be more than happy to help you out with that. I'll put my email in the chat box at the end of this as well. So committee hearings, we're gonna talk about how to speak at committee hearings in a moment briefly, but this is a key place. I would say probably 75% of legislators already have their mind made up on any given bill. But there's that other 25% that is swaying back and forth might be voting for it or against it because one of their buddies said that's what they're doing, but they're not totally sold. So if you go in there with a strong message that is succinct and to the point and convincing, you can change some votes. You can actually sway who, how those delegates or those senators will vote. It doesn't matter if you're their constituent or not. It matters that you spent the time to get up there to show up at that public hearing and make your statement. So we've been talking a lot about when and different ways you can talk to these elected officials, but how do I communicate effectively? This is the key part. How do I communicate effectively? Be clear 
and concise. These are the biggest words you're gonna see in my whole presentation because these are the most important words. Be clear and concise. I was at an event um, where there were some elected officials a couple months ago, and one of the folks I consider my mentor in advocacy was there and got up to make a statement. But this person hadn't taken the time to write down any notes this night and ended up losing their train of thought and started rambling. And they had to ask her what her point was. And they couldn't remember what their point they were trying to make was. And when they came back and sat down back beside me, they just looked at me with this deer in the headlights look like, I can't believe I just did this. So even the most experienced advocates still need to remember and work on being clear and concise. So how do we do this? This is where I said we're going to look a little bit at how, what type of structure can we use to our comments, to our emails, to our statements, whatever it might be, to our phone calls that will help us be clear and concise. And I said, I want to keep this simple. It's a two-step method. And there are going to be some variations on this, but it comes down to two steps. One, what's the problem? Every bill is addressing some problem or some perceived problem. And two, how does this bill affect the problem? So all of your communication with delegates and senators, with phone calls, with emails, speaking and doing public testimony should all be looking at these two issues. This is what those elected officials are listening for. They wanna know what the problem is, and how does this bill affect the problem? So let's look at different ways this can actually play out. It's not a problem. It is a problem, but this bill makes it worse. It is a problem and this bill will make it better. So this first one, it's not a problem. So there will be bills that are introduced that are trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist. Maybe that's because there was one random constituent who went into their delegate or senator's office and said, oh my goodness, I can't stand that you can have bumper stickers on the back of your car, they're just so annoying. And that elected official's like, okay, you know what? I'll write a bill about that, just to keep you happy, stop you from bothering me. But you know what? Bumper stickers, that can be a little annoying sometimes, right? But is it really a problem that needs to be addressed legislatively? Of course not. So if you have a bill, that is going against something that you believe in, that's going to cause some harm to a population that you're concerned about and that you advocate for, then you have to explain why the problem they think exists does not exist. So you explain why and how this bill would make things worse. Maybe this bill would make things worse because it infringes on individual liberties. Maybe it makes things worse because it's a waste of taxpayer money. Maybe it makes things worse because it minimizes a certain population. Maybe it's even unconstitutional. You make those arguments for why the bill is going to make things worse because it's not addressing an actual problem, and then ask them to vote no. So you're telling them this bill does not address a problem. This is why it's not a problem. This is how this bill makes it worse. Then say, please vote no. The next one, it is a problem, but this bill makes it worse. So there are some things out there in society that need to be fixed. But sometimes the proposed solution actually can make things worse. Um, there was a bill that I was working on some research for last year about public notification of toxic waste spills. Basically, if something goes into the, a public body of water, a river, a lake that has public access, something like that, then notification should be given that this body of water has been contaminated. But the way the bill was written, it made it sound like every single point of access, whether public or private, any place where a person might just slide their canoe in to that river would now need a sign, which isn't practical to put signs up along every point along a 50 mile, 100 mile river, but the bill was written so broadly that it made a problem worse. So what you want to do then is explain how this law, how this bill would exacerbate the issue. How would this bill make things worse? Then 
you want to provide an alternative. So what's your alternative going to be? It can be one of these three different things. One, you could propose a different idea. Hey, you know what? This is your bill. This is what you're doing. But here is a better idea for you to really help you achieve your goals. Two, you could propose a study. Virginia loves study bills. They love to kind of kick things down the road and say, well, let's, let's study this. Let's get some of the stakeholders at the table and really find out what's going on before we actually make any legislative decisions. Now, does this actually solve the problem? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but it stops the bill this year from coming into law. And usually, if somebody's coming up before the legislature for the first time, if somebody pushes and says it should be a study, we don't really know the details of this issue, that's the way they're going to go. And third, ask them to vote no until a better idea is proposed. This is really probably the best option for most of us if we're fighting against a bad bill. Just say, look, I agree that this is a problem, but this bill makes it worse. Can you vote no on this? And next year, let's see if something better can come up. The final one, the final possibilities we have here is it is a problem and this bill will make it better. This really is what we all hope for, right? These are the bills that we want to see pass. So this is most likely what you're going to be spending your most time on is going into offices, calling up delegates, sending emails saying, this bill addresses a problem that is real, that has impacted me, and this bill will make it better. So what you want to do in these cases is really bring your personal life into this, bring your personal story into this. Explain how you have experienced or witnessed this problem and how this bill will make it better. So what you're looking at here is communicating the idea that you are bringing some knowledge to this. You don't have to have a master of public policy or a PhD. You can have that lived experience. And honestly, that lived experience is probably better than some of the experience the folks coming out of those top schools are getting because they haven't walked in your shoes. They have not lived the life you've lived. As the saying goes, the folks closest to the problem are the folks closest to the solution. So if there's a bill out there that you want to support, because it somehow impacts you or impacts your loved one, that's where you want to really start telling the story about how this bill does address a problem. That problem is real. It needs to be addressed by the General Assembly and that this bill will do it effectively. And then at the end, you ask them to vote yes. Hey, David, you've got a uh, question in the chat. Okay, yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, see, Arvin says, sometimes how a study is structured drives a certain outcome. How do we avoid this scenario? You are exactly right. Um, in my work with the Solitary Coalition, we have seen the good and the bad, and then, or I guess the bad, the good, and then the bad again over this. So what you wanna do is make sure that you have a legislator who has some sway that will listen to you and take your advice. What happened um, last year in the General Assembly session, I said with the so Co Coalition on Solitary Confinement, we had a bill to end extended, extended isolation in Virginia. That bill we realized was not going to pass and it was gonna be turned into a study. We had enough bipartisan support for a study, but the study that it was originally proposed by the Department of Corrections was a very wimpy, weak study that really didn't hold them accountable. So what we were able to do was take a recommendation for a stronger study that we'd used a few years before and get that language inserted by just giving it to a friendly senator and say, hey, when you guys go into this, let's go ahead and um, take this study bill, but put this language in instead. And because at that point, you're dealing with so few elected officials, it's very easy if there's one that just says strongly, this is what we should do. That's what they did. So when a study is recommended, when you get to that point, be sure to have one in your back pocket that's already has the key groups you want to have represented, those key stakeholders, and not just the 
department that you're trying to get the study to change something in there. So it's all about getting those key stakeholders listed in the study bill and then getting that to the key legislator so it gets introduced. But that was a great question, Arvis. All right. So using your own story, we've got a few minutes left here about using our own story. So a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And your story is a picture of your life. Your story is the starting point. That's where you're gonna grab the attention. You're going to share that personal impact that happened in your life. For me, I spent 16 and a half months in solitary confinement in Norfolk, Virginia, in the city jail down there. That gets people's attention. So they're looking at me and say, oh, this happened to you. This is a real person now that's bringing this to light in front of me. Or this guy is a guy that's on the registry. This is a real person in front of me that's bringing this story to life. Where most of us get tripped up, and this has happened to me too, is we get so caught up in our story that we lose the point that we're trying to make. Because in our story, is a starting point, the policy is the ending point. So whenever we tell our story, whenever we're having these conversations with delegates or senators or speaking at a, um, at a hearing, we wanna make sure that we get to that ending point in a clear and concise way. So you start with your story, you start with that personal experience that grabs them. These are human beings and they do, no matter how hard they try, they are drawn into a personal narrative. So when I would start talking about solitary confinement, I would talk about my 16 and a half months in solitary confinement in the Norfolk City Jail, how I got one hour of rec time every two weeks. And that was my only guaranteed time outside of cell, except for two 10 minute showers a week. That gets them. They don't know that exists. They don't know that happens. They can't believe that's happening. And then at that point, that's where I end my personal story. They might want more information because it's almost like disaster porn. You're you want to hear more details. You want to be scared or disgusted or whatever. But you need to make that move to what is your actual policy. I mean, that's the end point. In that case, the end point is limiting the use of isolated confinement to no more than 14 days. And only under certain circumstances that where an individual is going to be putting themselves or others at risk along those lines. So you make the point about yourself, whatever part of your story you're trying to tell. Maybe you have a story of a loved one. Maybe there's something else that's happened to you. You're sharing that story and then you're moving on to what the policy is that you want to change. Now, that is the brief summary of communicating effectively during the General Assembly session. I'm advocating effectively during the General Assembly session. There are so many more things we could talk about. There's my email address, there's my website. I encourage you guys to go ahead and write that down. Um, you can go to my website and sign up for my newsletter on there as well. It's a monthly newsletter that covers some of these same topics. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Are there any other questions? Let me go ahead, I'm gonna stop my screen share now. Now, does anybody else have any questions they would like me to? Uh, address while we're here. I'll just chime in and say that uh, for folks participating, we're, we're going to be creating um, a Safer Virginia Zoom account so these future meetings won't be limited to 40 minutes. Those little things. We are Safer Virginia is now beginning to move into a bigger space that so we're getting there. Thank you very much, Kimberly, for your, your kind words. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, we will also be, we have been recording this, so we will be um, able to share this later on. I've got the emails of several people who want to have a copy. If you want a copy too, um, feel free to drop your email in the chat, either directly to me or Zach or publicly if you want. Um, one other thing since, let's see, how much time do we have left, Zach? Five minutes. See, about four minutes. All right. So I really want to encourage you all to, take time to think about what you're going to say before you say it. I don't want you to like, I don't mean to have everything written on a sheet of paper and read straight from that if that's not your thing, but actually at least sit down and talk it through. If you've never done this before, do some role play. 
either this with yourself in the mirror or by going and having someone else that you can talk with. Um, let me see. Yes, um, um, Kimberly is, is right. It's very normal to talk to a staff person and not the legislator. It's not a failure to talk to the, to the staffer. As an actual staffer myself, I will tell you that sometimes it's better to talk to the staffer because we're actually taking notes. That legislator probably has 15 other things on his or her mind, and they could be everywhere but present with you, even though they're standing with you face to face. But usually that staffer, they know they're taking the notes, and they want to make sure they know exactly what's going on so that they can give that information to their legislator, to their elected official, so that then that elected official can make the right decision on how they're going to vote. And I will tell you, as, a, as an aide, I've actually influence votes of my delegate based on conversations I had with random people stopping by. When they showed us information, when they showed us data that showed how a bill was bad that our delegate didn't have a strong opinion on, then yeah, that moves votes. And that's really the important thing we're talking about here is how to influence people. So when you go to those conversations, doesn't matter who you're talking to, make sure you have some good information either data if you've got it, which is really king, especially financial data, even the most um, compassionate legislators are always looking at that bottom line. Um, how to advocate when there is a problem, but the bill will make it better. Yes. Um, when there's harm, but yeah. So when there's a problem and the bill makes it better, that's when we're voting yes, right? That's when we want somebody to vote yes on a piece of legislation. So those are really the easiest ones because what we're doing is going in there and saying, this is why you should vote yes. Either here's my personal experience or here's the data that shows this. And <clears throat> then saying, with this information, I'm asking you to vote yes on this legislation. All right, I know this was a quick wrap up tonight. We only had, we wanna keep your time um, we want to value your time, and I appreciate everyone for showing up tonight. Um, as I said, be sure to drop your emails in the chat box or in a direct message to myself or Zach if you want to get a copy of tonight's recording once we've got that ready for you. Um, if you are interested in finding out more about the work of Safer Virginia, please reach out to myself or Zach, um, and we can we'll get back in touch with you. Queen, we are almost out of time, but I'll gladly take your question. You are on mute right now. Oh, unless you just wanted us to know to send the information to you, which we will definitely do that. All well, right. I, I'll, I'll jump in just to, to tap the meeting off. Thanks, everyone, for coming by. Uh, yeah, I posted the uh, info at safervirginia.org. Uh, email address that you can shoot stuff to and it should uh, be circulated. Um, you can also stop by our website. We should have a sign up for our news newsletter on there. Uh, if, if you're not already on there, that's a great place to get some news. We're trying not to bombard people, but uh, sometimes that happens. Um, again, we've got a, another meeting next Monday that's more geared towards people who are on the registry uh, and their families, loved ones, etc. Um, not really advocacy focused so much. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. And at this point, we've got <laughs> less than a minute left. So I think we'll end it. I'll save the chat. Uh, thank you very much, David. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. And have a great General Assembly session.